So most of you here probably don't know me, so I'll just introduce myself briefly first. My name is Alex Lee. Um, I'm currently going into my last year of law school at Stetson Law in Florida. I'm a member of the Social Justice Advocacy Concentration, and I'm also a legal intern with the Innocence Project of Florida. I want to take a brief moment to just thank Marking Time for the opportunity to be here today. And I also want to give a shout out to Mark Lodney, one of the Marking Time artists. I'm here on behalf of him today. It's a really big day for him. He's getting paroled today. So, shout out to Mark. So the topic for today's panel is going to be public art practices. As many of you have alluded to already, I think it's really important that we're talking about art in the social justice context. I think art has a really special way of being able to speak to things that words can't always do. So with that, I'll go ahead and introduce um, our first panelist, Jackie Summel. Uh, Jackie is a prison abolitionist and multidisciplinary artist inspired most by the lives of everyday people. Her work, anchored at the intersection of abolition, social practice, and contemplative studies, has been exhibited extensively throughout the U.S. and Europe. So with that, I welcome Jackie. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to do things a little differently and just roll through the slides myself. Um, I feel super awkward with this microphone in front of me, but I'll do my best. I want to extend gratitude to yourself. Hi. <laughs> um, to, you know, one of my heartthrobs, Maria Gaspar, who's on this part of this conversation in Lizette. Of course, to Nicole for um, the invitation to be here. For Joe for actually inviting me to come to Cincinnati and serendipitously, serendipitously lining up and to my van that actually brought me here. Um, oh wait, I use this button. Okay, so extending uh, the sentiment of gratitude, all of my personal and political orientation is because of my elders, Herman Wallace, Albert Wood Fox, and Robert King, who you see here. Um, in no uncertain circumstances would I have opportunities to conversate with such amazing people if it wasn't for these incredible men. Um, and the work that you're about to see is, is simply put, is my way of saying thank you. Um, as many of you know, I had the great leisure and fortune of spending 12 years collaborating with Herman Wallace on the, your right, the image on the right, um, during his 41 years in solitary confinement in Louisiana, so that's 41 years in a six foot by nine foot cell, a minimum of 23 hours a day from which Herman designed his dream home. And so I spent 12 years translating um, Herman's visions and imagination into an ongoing exhibition, which you can see here where I juxtaposed his reality, rebuilt his cell again and again and again and again, um, next to the power and strength of his imagination, his dream home. Um, again, as many of you know, after 41 years of isolation, Herman's conviction was overturned. He came home October 1st, 2013. He joined the ancestors just three days later from advanced stages of liver cancer, October 4th, 2013. Yeah. I live in Louisiana because of this man, right? Like, I made all, a, a bunch of really outrageous decisions to live in the murder capital and incarceration capital of the colonized United States to be closer to him. So you can imagine I was completely disoriented and devastated and trying to figure out what the heck I was going to do next. Um, but speaking of archives, I had thousands and thousands of letters, you know, this exchange with Herman, my elder, and, you know, visits to the prisons, phone, phone calls, etc. And so, you know, in that great disorientation and grief, I went back and looked at those letters and realized how much this man from 41 years of concrete and steel talked about gardens, talked about uh, trees, talked about wood, talked about um, the natural world. And to me, that felt really revolutionary. So I knew there was some way, actually, let me just back up. In fact, when I asked him, what kind of house does a man who's lived in a six foot by nine foot cell, then 29 years, 30 years, 41 years, dream of, he said, I can clearly see the gardens and they will be full of glaxinias, delphiniums, and roses. And I wish for guests to be able to smile 
and walk through gardens all year round. And the second thing he asked for was a swimming pool with a light green bottom and a large black panther at the center. So, you know, his priorities on point. Um, so fast forward 2013, Herman ascends. I'm trying to figure out what to do, go back, read these letters, see how much he's talking about gardens. And I'm like, okay, some way to uphold this man's life and legacy through the work of gardens. And then this project comes into existence, the Solitary Gardens, which uses that six foot by nine foot cell, um, the blueprint of that cell to create conversations between folks who are currently incarcerated, most in isolation, um, and volunteers on the outside. So you can see here the bed, the toilet sink, the desk, the bench, and then the gate at the front. You can see in this picture the garden beds themselves, you know, like are built after the standard blueprint of an isolation cell, but they're made out of sugarcane, cotton, tobacco, and indigo, the largest cattle crops that I'm actually growing in Louisiana, and then we mill them down, and then through this collective transformative process, build these prison cells, turn garden beds to illustrate that evolution, right? The evolution of chattel slavery into what we're calling mass incarceration. And then through these written letters and exchanges, folks are translating currently incarcerated folks' um, visions into the ground. And then in a lot of ways, the solitary gardens become portraits of folks who are condemned to the worst of our collective humanity. You can imagine that from this project, there's a lot of plants, plant material that comes out, and that gave birth to the abolitionist apothecary, which is the project that I'm traveling around with now. Um, and the abolitionist apothecary makes plant medicine um, from so many of the plants that we're growing at Solitary Gardens and our sister gardens, the abolitionist sanctuary um, in New Orleans. And so we have uh, a brick and mortar space, 1212 St. Bernard, Keith and Chandra, I hope to see you there. Um, another elder and friend of mine, John Thompson's building, so formerly known as Ray, Resurrection After Exoneration, currently in process for the John Thompson Legacy Center, which houses the abolitionist apothecary. And this plant medicine is then offered back to the community through various mutual aid channels, um, but also offers um, workshops and other things that are free for directly impacted folks, families, beloveds, and people organizing around social, social justice issues. Um, so this, like I said, this, this is just taken two days ago. This project's on the road with me. I arrived in this van, which houses the apothecary. Um, and then I'm rocking up to all these different cities over the course of the next three months, having these public faces, facing conversations around the different ways. Yeah, hey, Mary. Um, that plants teach us how to be better people. Mary's part of this project, right? The different ways that plants not only teach us about abolition, but how to better love on each other. Um, which I think if we move slow enough, we can hear, we can listen, and we can learn. Um, this project rocked up to PS1 in New York, um, where there's this ongoing growing abolition project that's, again, juxtaposing the reality of human beings' lives by taking a cell. One of the solitary gardeners I had the pleasure of working with for now seven years is incarcerated at ADX. We know 80% of ADX is underground, so taking Jesse's lived experience underground, being invisible to most of the world and to our consciousness, and then making it transparent by building a greenhouse that is the same size and blueprint as Jesse's cell, and then growing plants that then are gifted out to our community partners um, with that same intention of letting the plants teach us how to be better abolitionists. And so this whole project is in collaboration with the Lower East Side Girls Club, um, as well as the community partners. And what I think is really beautiful is, like, you know, when you rock up into PS1, I think somebody said it earlier, it looks like a, a prison yard, right? You have these large architectural concrete oppressive walls, and then suddenly you have this greenhouse that you see um, as a modality of torture. It looks like a cell. And so what I was really asking for these plants to do is teach us about liberation as much as abolition and the different ways that they might transcend, escape, transmute, confinement. Um, and within that, there's these little QR codes that you could link on, boop, and it'll take you to this online um, archive of these public or sorry, these conversations. Um, so you can imagine, you, you click on one of those little QR codes, 
you learn about the different um, histories attributed to Lufa, which is the plant that Madison is standing next to. Um, and then there are a series of contemplative questions which challenge us to move at the pace of plants, the pace of nature, um, to hold space and to think about um, all the different ways that, that, that we know in this conference, but all the different ways that a, another world is possible, that an abolitionist-centered world is possible. So I know I wrapped it up real, real fast. I got the cue to do this in seven minutes or less. Um, and so there's my contact. If you all have any questions, please don't be shy. Just hit me up. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. We'll have our next two panelists. Um, they'll be with us via Zoom. All right, so first we have Lizette. Lizette, I'm sorry in advance if I butcher your last name. Um, Lizette Oblitas is the Administrative Assistant at the Society of Fellows and the Heyman Center for the Humanities at Columbia University. As a visual artist, her work has been displayed in different cities in the U.S., such as the Brooklyn Museum, the American Visionary Art Museum, and the Meyer Museum of Art. So, Lizette, if you can just unmute yourself. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I apologize deeply from the bottom of my heart for not being there. I ended up enjoying my lower back, and things just changed um, drastically, and I'm in a little of pain, but um, managing, but nevertheless excited to be here uh, and, and to be part of this uh, conversation. Um, my work... Um, started, well, my work with the arts started since I was a child. I believe that at the times of like the most, um, when I experienced most uh, painful experiences, I also find uh, found refuge in art creating. Uh, it allowed me to process what I couldn't control and I couldn't digest. So as a child growing up in Peru uh, at a time where there was a lot of um, problem issues, economic issues, terrorism, this is back in the early, um, late 80s, early 90s, uh, around the same time that my parents left the United States to come to the U.S., and I found myself always throwing myself and kind of just losing myself and zoning out as an attempt to try to avoid um, the reality or escape from the reality that I was um, enduring myself as a, as a young child, being separated from my parents because of the economic circumstances and the violence perceived at the moment. Uh, then as I got older and then I migrated to the United States as a teenager, um, I felt uh, the cultural crash of coming from a developing country to the United States and settling in a small um, village, Portchester, New York, where I found myself surrounded with a lot of people that spoke Spanish, thankfully, uh, but yet they were so different than I was. They were no Peruvian, first, um, first of all, and it was a great opportunity to get to know many people, but at the same time, it was very scary because I had to include... Um, the fact that I was reuniting with a mother that I had not seen for so many years. And in a way, we were distant to one another. We were different. In my mother's mind, I was a child and I was in my head. Um, you know, I saw my mother, but not quite my mother because she was not really there for the times of uh, uh, certain years of my growth. And so I, again, while in high school, a way of coping was creating art and I, and I was uh, creating art in, um, high school, I took the AP art class, which was very impressive, and that's when I was able to be exposed to different media, which I didn't have in Peru. I only had color pencils and I think crayons. Other than that, I didn't know anything about uh, charcoal media or pastels or like oil pastels, oils. Uh, for that, I didn't have to go to special school and I could not afford it while I was in Peru. So that was a good exposure to my art uh, and the way in which I kind of transpire my emotions and my way of coping with life circumstances onto um, a media. And then um, the third part where I felt that art had the greatest impact was during my incarceration, which started in 2010. 
um, after a car crash that I was leaving the Mohegan Sun in Connecticut and led to the death of Mrs. Phyllis Porter, a 77 year old lady from uh, Norwich, Connecticut. Um, the process was similar, the pain, the sorrow, um, the inability to, to express my pain and, and shame um, besides the rules and regulations within the prison, uh, a structure that really demoralizes you and removes you from um, your identity to the core, right? Anything that I was past my incarceration was suddenly deleted, and now my new identity was a killer, pretty much. Um, and I relied on the opportunity that the prison provided, uh, which was limited, in the amount of number of people that could be and could benefit from this art program. Um, and I kind of became obsessed with art. I was able to do anything and everything that I could always draw in, it, whether it was doodling or, or just shading or just comparing colors, mixing media. Um, I just apply the arts to, in a way that Again, it allowed me to process the emotions that I didn't know how to describe, I couldn't put a name on. Um, and it was very therapeutic because I could always go back and kind of by looking at the way in which I used the texture or I created uh, doodles or, or the colors that I used, I can kind of determine the mood that I was in and kind of could see in colors what I was experiencing emotionally. And that was very powerful to me. Uh, and so while incarcerated, we created uh, the, um, sorry, my back, um, Share Diamond, uh, which, you know, somehow it got out of the uh, prison walls, which the women uh, and I never intended, never thought, never foresaw working in an art project, which just started as a, just a simple workshop created for a couple of days, uh, brought in by Jolie, the now retired librarian at your correctional institution where I served my time. And uh, it was a very powerful experience in the sense that not only were we able, uh, women were able to gather in a safe space, which was the library at the time, but we were also able to connect in ways that we never had uh, as individuals, given the uh, culture within the prison facility, um, we were always known each other by the crime we commit, We commit, right? Uh, we don't really know much about individuals as who they were prior to their incarceration, right? And that is because of where we are located in the structure where the, that prison itself doesn't allow mingling among inmates. Um, and so this opportunity of creating this art piece to honor a female, um, entity, person, a uh, historical character, uh, uh, piece of literature, a uh, name, uh, a goddess, whatever you want to call that, but whatever you use that, that's a uh, female being will provide a way of showing the world what is important to you, what is important to us women and working in this project uh, honoring a, a female um, person or entity really allowed for us to create a, a, a strong level of community among women. It really allowed us to remove the facade that we were all carrying while serving our time, being tough, you know, showing witnesses. And we were able to really like drop those walls and really reach a point where we were able to encourage each other. In the whole process of creating art, we were very self-conscious about what we were doing. Like I wanna honor someone. How do I use it? What colors do I use? How do I express the emotions that I have? And, and the women were very good about helping one another, uh, cheering one another one person up when someone said, oh, I don't like this color, it's ugly, or no, this is not coming out well. And, you know, we started off with comparing one another. And as we were continuing to work on this project, which started just for a couple of days workshop and moved into monthly, almost six months of uh, project and elaboration and, and working together, it really, um, at the end, it showed the work of women working united as opposed to divided, right? And it was, 
very therapeutic for me specifically the work of art uh, and honoring Mrs. Phyllis Porter as the person that I wanted to honor in this art piece really um, transformed my life because it offered me an opportunity to create a space where I could find forgiveness, where I can create a garden and in this imaginary space that only the art provided for me, um, I could ask for forgiveness and then hear her say that she forgave me for my shortcomings and for the mistake that ended up taking her life. And this was a, a experience that I had never experienced in any other way while incarcerated. Unfortunately, um, the, the justice system didn't have a, a way of providing a restorative justice where I can, you know, be connected with a family member and have them hear me out and hear where I was at my life and how much the experience of this uh, car accident uh, also impacted my life and my loved ones and how sorry I was and, and, and how I wanted to make amends. Uh, and I was not really able to hear from them because the structure of the justice system didn't allow that. I believe that nowadays your correctional institution is working with a program called Worth, where they do have a more um, tone towards restorative justice and they're doing more things um, to uplift the spirit of the women and allow them to flourish um, post-incarceration. Uh, or while also serving time. So doing the, uh, this work really empowered me to not find shame and, and accepting my mistakes and, and being open about, and being vulnerable and open uh, about my own life experience and where I stand. Uh, and I continue to use arts in any way I can during the pandemic. I couldn't do much of drawing because being in the rooms, being in a room isolated kind of brought emotions and maybe PTSD of what incarceration was like when I was released. But then I started doing a lot of other forms of art and jewel planting. And now my bedroom is pretty much a garden. Uh, plants took a new um, um, way of living and seeing the world. And now I'm working and incorporating my art projects with life plans, uh, which I think it's interesting. Um, and, and so I think that the, the work that the women did in terms of share dining and how eventually left your correctional institution and in 2015, the summer of 2015 was displayed next to the original um, dinner party by Judy Chicago um, was a great experience. I think it allowed individuals to look at the work that women created um, that doesn't speak, speak of their crime, but it brings their humanity. It, it allows individuals to see that we're more than our mistakes, that we have a past, and then, you know, within all the negative things that so socially we're known for, the crimes, there are, also, there are stories behind, and there's that prior story to that, and there's a post story to that. And that was very powerful in itself. I got a lot of feedback and positive uh, response for, for the audience. And it was through this art piece that Nicole Fleetwood actually reached out, wanting to learn about my story. Um, and, and so I think that the work is just getting started. There's so much more that we can do, especially women incarcerated, women that had experienced incar incarceration, which is usually not the same as when men are incarcerated. Um, um, but so I thank you very much for allowing me this time uh, to talk and share my experience. And I, I thank uh, Nicole Fleetwood for the great job. And I commend everyone involved, all the artists involved in this wonderful project book. If you haven't gotten the book, I highly suggest you go and get it. You learn so much. Uh, and hopefully, you know, this type of work will bring um, awareness within all throughout the United States on, on mass incarceration and how we approach um, the justice system, right? Converting a punitive system into more restorative, where there really are ways in which we can help rehabilitate women, not allow them to go back worse than how they came in. 
and art is definitely one of the forms, more organic form in which someone can start the healing process. Art therapy, in my opinion, should be one of the main, the first tools that should be utilized, especially in women's prison. Not to say that men are not important, men as well, but women um, really, really need it because I find that sometimes we have, we go through so many emotions that we can really express or really name. And I think through the process of art and using art as a therapeutic form to get into understand um, ourselves and maybe allow it allow us as well to put a name to that emotion and starting that healing process. Um, so that is, that is it. Thank you very much you so for allowing me to speak. All right, we have one more panelist for today. We have Maria Gaspar. Maria is a Chicago-born interdisciplinary artist whose practice addresses issues of spatial justice to amplify, mediate, or divert structures of power through individual and collective gestures. Maria is the recipient of several different fellowships, grants, and other notable awards, and has exhibited at MoMA, the Contemporary Arts Museum, and the San Jose Museum of Arts. So with that, I'll hand it over to Maria. Hi, good morning everybody, or yes, well it's afternoon uh, where you're at, it's still morning where I'm at, so <laughs> can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, yeah okay, good, okay. Um, uh, thank you so much, uh, Jackie and Lisette, for your presentations. I've been following along since yesterday, virtually, uh, so I'm so glad I was able to connect that way. I, I'm also very sorry I cannot be there in person, um, but I, I hope um, we can gather again soon and I can meet you all in real life. Um, so I have a short presentation to, to offer and um, a couple of questions that I know Nicole posed that I might try to weave into the presentation. And, um, oh, it says here, participant uh, screen sharing is disabled. Do you mind letting me share the screen? There we go. Okay, thank you. All right, I hope you can see my presentation. Um, so, uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, uh, my name is Maria Gaspar. I'm coming to you from Chicago, which is uh, where I'm from. Um, if anybody's familiar with the city, uh, I grew up on the west side of Chicago, which is also the home to the largest single site uh, jail in the country, Cook County Department of Corrections. Um, I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about this specific place because this is where I've spent a lot of time working as an artist and as a teacher. Um, and this is also uh, is part of my landscape uh, where I grew up. Um, what you're seeing right now is recent footage of the demolition of Division One which has been in process uh, for about um, 10 months now. Um, so I've been working uh, around prisons and jails for a little over 10 years. Um, I kind of came to doing this work via being a community artist in Chicago and um, I started doing murals and mosaics with young people and um, family since I was a teenager. So. Uh, kind of doing public art was just a part of my experience of, of uh, my own art education. Um, it wasn't in a museum or gallery, it was just on the street, mostly learning from local artists who were willing and generous enough to just let me grab a brush and uh, allow me to help them paint a mural on a, on a wall. Um, and part of what also kind of got me interested in uh, working specifically uh, around an Atka County Jail was um, really thinking about how a jail is both visible and invisible within an urban context and beyond. And uh, Little Village is predominantly a Mexican first generation, second generation immigrant community. Um, people live right across the street uh, around this 96 acres compound. Um, so I wanted to really think about how people see the jail, how the 
people inside of the jail see this neighborhood and what that relationship is like. This is a series of images that's part of the show that Nicole curated, and it's a series of screenshots using Google Earth where I toured parts of the jail. And this was almost 10 years ago, and at the time, using Google Earth, you can actually go inside of the institution using Google Earth and take screenshots. And now, if you try using it, it doesn't allow you to even get within, like, 50 feet of virtual space. But I was thinking about the porousness of the wall and thinking about this as a sort of abolition, a gesture for abolition. What would it be to make those walls porous, and what can we imagine instead? So context is really important to my public art practice. I think it's really important to think about the place, the people, what life is like in a place. And because this is my own neighborhood, I've thought a lot about the way that communities celebrate, the way people come together, the way they express joy. My mother was a radio DJ in the local Boys and Girls Club, so sound and communication has also really been an interesting part of how I think about space. But also the way that people grieve. This is a public memorial in honor of a young boy named Adam Toledo who was shot by police last year, and Adam grew up just a few blocks away from my parents' house. Part of my work includes just looking at the space in different ways and recording it through sound and video and photography. This is an image of a carnival that takes place right outside of the jail every summer. It looks photoshopped, but it's a real image. And I was thinking a lot about how people look at the jail or look at the carnival and which direction are people looking, who looks, who turns away. This is the view from a major street bus called the Number 60 bus that goes from downtown Chicago out into the suburbs, and it passes right by the jail. And so this is a view from inside of the jail looking out from the same location. This is Division I before it was demolished. So in 2012, I started a project called 96 Acres Project, and this was a collaborative project with many different people, some of whom are in this picture, journalists, artists, activists, formerly incarcerated people, organizers, teachers, really neighbors, community leaders, different kinds of people participated. And we did a series of eight site interventions at and around the perimeter of the jail. This is a still from a project we did called the Visibility Project, where we invited an ensemble of actors to come and host a series of pedagogy of the oppressed exercises with community members. And this was all stationed right across the street from the jail. And we also created kites that then we flew with messages that were intended to be communicated to the people inside of the jail. And the women that are part of this ensemble are formerly incarcerated women who have used art as a way to empower and to share their stories with community members. Another project we did was called Not Just Another Day, and this is a public art project that we did with a group of young people from the neighborhood, and they created text and quotes that were then power washed around the jail just using a regular power washer. So I have a really short clip I'll show. What does it mean to have a jail in the community, and what does it mean to see the jail throughout the neighborhood? I think it's getting people to think about it like uh, the jail's here, it's my backyard, but like doing this is like, you know, it's trying to get your thoughts like, yo, yeah, why do we have a jail like right here? And in this community, you're like, that makes so much money as something like this here, you know? Um, and then the last project that I'll talk about is called Radioactive Stories from Beyond the Wall. And this was done in 2018. Um, and again, all of these projects are, are multi year, so uh, I'm unable to give you the whole context for, you know, like the process, but I hope to give you a little bit of a glimpse. Um, and this is a project um, that I and another collaborator uh, workshopped inside of um, Division 6. And we worked with about a group of 50 uh, men, which we renamed ourselves the, the Radioactive Ensemble. 
And what we produced are drawings and original audio recordings that were then projected and broadcast outside of the Cook County Jail through live radio program and also through on-site high-definition projectors. And the wall essentially became a kind of amplification device. And we really wanted to make that jail wall be visible, be a kind of a place to communicate, and also a wall to make more porous. And the workshops that we did were not always about image making. Oftentimes, we were just, we were doing performance work. We were moving our bodies. We were looking at other artists' work and talking about process and play. And, you know, a lot of what some of the presenters have shared in the past two days, I think for me really, really resonates because there's this moment of transformation that happens within a creative experience, regardless of it being in a place of incarceration. There was something that we created, even briefly, that allowed us to generate these, you know, different ideas. Some of the ensemble members were released from Cook County Jail. Again, that's a pre-detention facility. Some of them were in a recovery program, so they had to be there for 90 days. And so we were able to do post-production. So this is, you know, Christopher and Ali helping kind of think about what the sequencing of the animation that was then projected was going to be like. And then Christopher was formerly a radio DJ back in the day, and so he did the voiceovers for the project, which we then used for the final work. So our project looked like this. I don't really have time to show you a video, but... I talked about my experience while I was incarcerated and giving people a chance, you know, just letting them see them. But maybe you can get some glimpses of the images that we produced. But they basically took a part of the interior of the jail and then personified it through a narrative. So, for example, Douglas decided to choose a mirror inside of the jail that was foggy and where he couldn't see his reflection anymore. And he produced this very beautiful poem that was about being unable to see himself and feeling like he didn't exist. And so here's the projected version of that image onto the wall, and then it's overlapped with his voice and his story. So I'm happy to talk some more, but thank you so much for your attention, and I'll stop here. Thank you so much, Maria. I know we're running short on time, but we can take one or two questions if anyone from the audience has them. Questions from anyone? I would first like to thank all of you. Um, I appreciated this so much. Um, my question is for Jackie, right? Okay. Um, so I work with high schoolers who are working with someone in solitary. Um, and I just had a question about what was the kids' you know, response to that? What was their, um, maybe what was the lesson or curriculum? Um, but how did the students respond to solitary um, gardens? Well, I'm not sure which students you're talking about specifically. Oh, the girls club? Yeah, the girls yeah. club. Yeah, so I think what's really important to that is, um, somebody has said it gracefully, I think it was Lizette, you know, that context is, is critical for this understanding, context and time. And so to have this durational experience where we're processing this reality together, um, you know, I can't speak per se for the girls, but much like what we're doing as artists, the girls are then producing an exhibition um, where they get to share what that experience was like. And the curriculum, I'm, I'm happy to share with you the different things that are happening, but it's like kicking it with Mary, you know, and, and, and like being in proximity with folks who are alchemists who have taken these experiences and transmuted them and then made something not only beautiful but powerful and life-changing, right? And so having girls who are often directly impacted be in direct proximity to that 
um, and then watching the way that they uh, translate that experience for me is is really really humbling. Um, yeah, and you know, like I started this work in two thousand one. Right, you, you, you probably can't tell because I look so young, but um, that's like 20 plus years of doing this, right? And that's 2001, pre-Michelle Alexander's book, The National Conversation Around Mass Incarceration. There's very few folks, you know, that are talking about the, experience, the lived experiences of extreme isolation. And Herman and Albert, I was green as fuck, you know, like I didn't know anything. And Herman and Albert received me with such a spirit of generosity and love and hope and possibility. And so, you know, I feel like it is my duty to meet these young folks in the same place when they know or don't know or whatever, you know, or on their phones while I'm like sharing the life story of Herman Wallace, you know? And so like being really fluid and flexible is, is a big part of curriculum, yeah. We have time for one more question. We have one more. Thank you to everyone uh, on the panel. My question is for Maria. Uh, with the site-specific interventions, was there pushback from the jail? Like, what did the process of kind of utilizing their walls and space, like, how did that work? Yeah, thank you. I didn't, I didn't have a chance to really talk about that. Um, so, you know, when when I first uh, started working on the 96 Acres Project, um, it was in collaboration with a community development organization that's been around for you know 25 years, and um, I think it was you know we're talking about context. It's it was really important, even though was, I'm from that neighborhood. It was really important to partner with um, many other people, many other stakeholders. And um, that organization also has a violence prevention program and does a lot of really great work uh, within schools. And so that that I think partnership gave us the gave us the capacity to then approach the jail with with this idea. And I mean, you know, uh, it's always a little bit um, fuzzy, uh, at least in my experience, because um, you know. All of the projects were funded through grants, uh, you know, grants and awards. Um, nothing comes out. Nothing came from the jail itself. Um, so they essentially, you know, they got a free program. Uh, like Radioactive was was like sort of a free program for them. Um, and then in terms of the public art project, uh, you know, they just let us use the wall, but they didn't even. We wanted some electricity, but they wouldn't provide electricity because it was a safety concern. So we brought generators in. So it, you know, I think that they they certainly gave us the green light, but there wasn't any more that they were willing to sort of uh, help with per se. Uh, but they did give us access to working with an ensemble and producing the work. So that was important. But I think it was that community partnership that um, you know got us uh, access to just having a meeting with them and talking with them and. Um, you know, initially the executive, um, well, basically the warden who was there was a proponent of art, and she really, really uh, liked what we were doing, and so she was very willing to, to let us uh, kind of brainstorm ideas with her. So I think that that's what really kind of allowed us to, to get in, but then she left, so, um, you know, it, it became a little bit more cumbersome, and as you know, the turnover rates are sometimes like you know really high so you've got one person you're working with and then a year later it's another person and two years later it's another person so that also made it really difficult um, but some of the some of the um, program directors actually showed up to the project well we, we know you know Tom Dart never showed up to any of the projects but um, some of the program people did which was which was great to see um, yeah I can go on some more but I don't want to take too much time I hope that answered your question Thank you, Maria. All right, and then um, just to close out, I actually have one additional question for Lizette. Um, I know, Lizette, you spoke about how your incarceration not only affected you, but your family um, on the outside as well, and I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how you used art as an outlet and whether or not 
um, you know, I know you said it helped you on the inside, but maybe if it also had an impact on connecting with your family and loved ones who you were separated from during that time as well. Thank you, that's a really good question. Um, I've been blessed to have my family nearby and they were really good about coming to the uh, prison to visit me, even though the prison, uh, the drive that require like good hour and a half uh, commute one way and then another hour and a half. Uh, so it was a total of three hours uh, back and forth. Uh, where my mom, my dad, uh, my sister, and one of the children will come in. Uh, the downside of it is that because my parents were coming from New York to see me at a prison in Connecticut, uh, there were not really any specific rules or any special rules where they were be allowed to stay longer than most visits. Visits last an hour, and after you hour mark is done, then you have to go. Uh, so the way in which I use art not so much art, although I did do a lot of cards, like whenever my nieces, first days and nephews will come in, I will try to create uh, homemade or like man-made uh, cards. I never really spent any money to buy like birthday cards that you would, the, the institution sell. I would just utilize my art supplies that I was you know, privileged to have through the art prison program to which only 15 minute, 15 women were, um, would benefit from uh, at a prison where there are daily a thousand women. Uh, so imagine how everyone had uh, the access to the coloring uh, paper and uh, color pencils. They could buy color pencils from the commissary, but they were like the cheapest kind that they would just like release that uh, oil waxy texture, but there was no color whatsoever. Uh, but so that was my way in which I can kind of um, make up for the time that I was not there to see my nieces and nephew grow. Uh, the transition from my nephew, who I am his uh, mother, um, I recall that he cried, I cried when I noticed the change in his voice from a young teenager, 13 year old. Uh, old kid with a high teach voice into like a you know a brown teenager uh, when he went to see me and then he's a hard dear and I'm like Joseph what happened to your voice? Uh, but so I made those connections through uh, love letters and drawings and and collage which I was able to uh, gather from the library and send it to them and they saved them and when I came out, you know, they showed me a little box where they had got their older letters that they sent to me. So that was kind of like my way of, of making up for the time and, and finding oh, another way to give them love while not physically there, but through my art, just putting a lot of attention to the details, to the uh, colors and the images that I chose in creating these cards and, and letters to them. Awesome, well thank you so much. I think we had someone uh, talk about cards earlier as well and the importance it had to them in connecting with others. So thank you and thank you to the other two panelists as well. Um, I think with that we're breaking for lunch. Until 1.15. Until 1.15. So yeah, everyone enjoy your lunch and thank you so much. You know, it's my pleasure to introduce um, our and an uh, enormous supporter of Mark, the initiative marking time, and it's Julie Ehrlich of the Mellon Foundation. The Mellon Foundation made this gathering possible. We could not have come together without uh, their support. So we're deeply, deeply grateful. Um, I want to lift up the, um, the you know, historic leadership of um, Dr. Elizabeth Alexander, who is the president of the Mellon Foundation. Um, previously, was a huge supporter of the Art for Justice Fund during her time at the Ford Foundation and really believes in the power of art to transform society and to end um, the carceral state as we know it. So Julie, do you want to come join us? Uh, good afternoon everyone. I'm only going to take a couple minutes because um, there was a lot more great conversation to be had, but I just wanted to take an opportunity um, to say hello. For those of you who haven't met yet, as Nicole said, my name is Julie Ehrlich. I um, am the Director of Presidential Initiatives 
and the chief of staff at the Mellon Foundation, where I have the great honor of working directly with Elizabeth Alexander. Um, uh, and some of the folks in this room, their work is featured in her most recent book, so it's been really nice to um, have Jeff is still here. But, um, but it's been really great to be here with you all. So I just wanted to say a couple words about our work and why we're, why we're so, um, so, so honored to be um, supporting Working Time. So, and I'll say just on a personal note before I jump in, um, that in addition to my work, my role at Mellon, um, I'm also a lawyer who worked on behalf of incarcerated and um, criminalized mostly women and girls for a long time, and also a close family member of someone who spent over a decade inside. So this work is really personal uh, to me and to my professional commitments as well. Um, so, as I said, we at Mellon are so, so proud to support Working Time, um, and not only this, um, this weekend's events, but also the Archiving Working Time project that Stephen Miranda talked about. Um, and um, one of our core beliefs at Mellon is that the arts and humanities play a critical role in uncovering and interrogating our collective histories our fractured, and our fractured present so that we can better understand the world we live in today and, and what we need to do to create a more just future for all of us. Our commitment to building just communities is not complete if we don't engage with the criminal legal system, which, as you all know deeply, is one of the most unjust societies in American society, not only today, but historically. Um, and, we, and so at Mellon, we've been supporting higher education and prison programs for about a decade, and I'm another one, member of the Kai Stevens fan club, so um, I was glad to hear her invoked a couple times today. Um, but we recently created a new initiative, um, grant making initiative, held out of the president's office where I work, um, that engages and intervenes into the criminal legal system beyond higher education programs. Um, so we believe that the arts and humanities have crucial power and unique power to counter the forces of separation, othering, silencing, and dehumanization of the, of the criminal legal system. Thanks for bearing with me with written remarks. I'm not as good at um, extemporaneous the speaker as most of the folks in this room. Um, we also think that the arts and communities are uniquely able to make visible and confront the system's toll, the criminal legal system's toll, on the human dignity of individuals with direct carceral experience, their families, loved ones, and close communities and ultimately on all of us. Mellon hasn't yet formally publicly announced this initiative, although I guess I've done so on the live stream today, so you know, it's like a secret for the, whoever is watching. But uh, we're going to, we just need a good name for it, so if anyone has any naming ideas for this work, let us know. Um, but we've been building relationships and having conversations for some time, and are already down to business supporting currently and, form, currently and formerly incarcerated and other system impacted story, storytellers, artists, scholars, thinkers and others who are um, doing important work, including through grants to the Right of Return Fellowship, to the Justice Arts Coalition, to an organization called Freedom Reads, and to um, others who start with, from the dignity and knowledge of system impacted folks and um, acknowledge and lift up the intrinsic value of their work. And others who also seek to nurture um, the participation of system impacted, currently formerly incarcerated and other folks who've experienced personal control, um, their participation and leadership in intellectual and imaginative communities, both inside carceral spaces and outside carceral spaces, and in work that crosses those, um, those literal and figurative walls. So for years, Marking Time has been instrumental in creating and holding space for this work and, and this community. Led by Nicole's vision, commitment, brilliance, and fierce dedication, and we are so honored to be here with you, Nicole, with Stephen, Miranda, Anissa, Xavier, I don't know where they all went. <laughs> um, and um, thank you for all you do, for creating this space, for doing this work, and for bringing us all together. And congratulations on the big undertaking the symposium has been and that we all are um, privileged to be part of. So thank you all, and thank you.